For our scripture reading this morning, I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to, again, the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be looking at chapter 11. Our text particularly is found in just the words of uh, verse 12, but we'll read the first 21 verses of this chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is God speaking to his people, and God is reminding his people who he is, who he is, and who they are before a holy God. And with those thoughts, we begin reading the word of God, beginning at chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God, and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his acts, his signs and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his land. What he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Datham and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their household, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may Prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord your God, for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it, from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I, will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. So far we'll read from God's word this portion of it, from Deuteronomy chapter 11. May the Lord bless those words. I want to direct you especially to the words of verse 12, and I'm going to read that verse again. 
This uh, speaks about the land that they're about to enter into, and it says, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it, from beginning of the year to the very end of the year. Beloved people of God, today we stand at the end of a year, just two days away, and we say the calendar changes, and we're on the threshold of a new year, 2013. And it's not just a day when you switch calendars, even though that's a nice thing to do because they get a little shabby by now. All written, scribbled full of things that we've done, sort of a history. But this is a new year. We might be tempted to say, well, it's not such a big thing. It's just another day and another year. So what? But that would be missing the significance of the concept of time that God has taught us. God teaches about time, even though he's eternal, he knows we're creatures of time. We're here only for so many years, and then our life is finished. The eternal God created time. You sometimes think time has just always gone on. Well, the eternal God began time. We read it in the very first words of the Bible, in the beginning. That's the beginning of time. That's where it starts. And he formed the days because he created mornings and evenings and that was a day. And those days would add up and those days would become a month and then those days would become a year. And God also marks time for us in terms of years. And so it's not unusual to say this is a change of a year. Remember also God's promise to Noah that the seasons of the year would not change. He would not destroy man. He would carry it out as long as the earth still stood. There would be seasons. There would be years. As we read in Isaiah chapter 46, at the beginning of the service today, we read, for I am God and there is no other. So don't look anywhere else for time. Don't look for anyone else to uphold you in the days ahead. Sometimes we put our, our hope in the government and we say, well, we're, we're nearing a fiscal cliff and if only they'll just do something to save us all. Man can't save anyone. There is but one God, there is no other. There's none like me, he says. No one else but God can declare the end from the beginning. God knows time because God is eternal. He created time. He began time for us. And so when God looks at history, he sees it all. He sees it entirely. Just think of it, how someone can see all of history in one glance, just one glance. It boggles our minds. We barely can see a couple days. And we can barely remember things of the past sometimes. God sees it all. And he sees it all at once. We talk in terms of a beginning and an end. But God sovereignly determines the end from the beginning. And it's sort of reversed for us and for God. We see a beginning and then we see an end to things. But God sees just the reverse. He sees the end from the beginning. And that's where we stand as creatures different from the almighty God. We read in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, that beautiful chapter 3, which we often read around New Year's Day, about time. There's a time for this and a time for that. But the very first verse says this, to everything there is a season, a time, for every purpose under heaven. It's talking about God's purposes there, not ours. It's what God has determined would happen on a particular day. And then we go all the way to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 10. And in the book of Revelation, we read in verse 6, there'll be a time when time will be no more. There'll come that day when time will be no more. What does that mean? Well, it means we enter into eternity. We have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Everlasting. Time will be no more. You don't have to 
have calendars in heaven, I don't think, because we don't worry about which year it is. <laughs> now we do. We have birthdays, and we say, well, I'm so many years old. And so we mark it off on our calendars, but time will be no more in heaven. That day will come too. But now we're creatures of time. We're pilgrims. We're still walking toward that day. And it's true that the eternal God is not bound by time like we are. The, the scriptures say a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day to God. He doesn't see time like we do. And there's a simple reason for that. It's because we can't see past today. We don't know what will happen in our lives tomorrow. We don't know what God's providence will bring. We know God will be with us. We know certain things, but we don't know the exact events. But for God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So even though God is above time, he is yet marking out time for us. I think that's why it's so amazing that our Lord here speaks in this text of the fact that his care and his watchfulness is from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. So God is marking time just like we would, in a sense, by taking time and sort of chopping it into one-year blocks. And God says, I am with you from the beginning of that year to the end, and every year after that as well. Now, in our text that we're looking at here in Deuteronomy chapter 11, you need to understand that Israel was standing at the threshold of something great. It wasn't a new year. They're about to enter the land of promise. The things that God promised Israel for their future are very much the same as what we realize as we face a new year as well. We're still pilgrims. Israel was still in a pilgrimage. And they were awaiting the promised land. Sometimes the, the land of Canaan or the promised land, especially in, in many of the hymns that we sing, uh, is sort of equated with heaven. That's the Jerusalem. That's the Zion. That's heaven. Well, if you look at what Israel did, that wasn't exactly heaven when they got into the promised land because they did sin. And they, they were punished by God even. They fell short every day. So it's not exactly a perfect parallel, even though we say that was their goal to enter a promised land, and it's ours too. But we should see that that's not a perfect analogy. We are now living in that Jerusalem or that promised land as a church. We're redeemed, we're saved, we're justified by, by grace through faith in Christ, and we have that salvation. We're set free. We have not yet entered the kingdom of heaven itself. With that in mind today, I want you to put yourself now in Israel's place. As you journey and as you live in that promised land, as you live as a church in this present era, that's what the Lord is speaking to. And he says, I'm watching over you and I'm caring for you every day, beginning of the year to the end of the year. The first thing that strikes us is this. It's that the Lord cares for the future. This doesn't mean that the Lord is just concerned or that he observes or that he cares about the future. That's not what this is saying. He actually provides for the future. That's what his care is. When the Lord says, put your cares upon me, that means your worries because he cares for you doesn't mean he's concerned for you. He's thinking about you. He provides for you. That's his loving care. And he does it because he loves us. Again, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, God didn't set his love upon you or choose you or make you his people because you were better than anyone else, but simply because he loves you and he keeps his word. He keeps his promise, keeps his covenant. That's why the Lord has chosen Israel. That's why the Lord chooses us. He keeps his word. He made a covenant to us and to our children. And God says, I won't break my word. That doesn't mean that every covenant child or every covenant person 
is going to be going to heaven. Many in Israel never made it. They were punished because they were unfaithful. So within that covenant, there are blessings and there are curses. And he says, if you serve me well, I'll bless you. The rain will fall from heaven. I'll water your land. You'll have good crops. But if you're unfaithful, and if you take your eyes away from me and worship idols, I'll stop the rain. And you'll perish from the land. But we need to hear this, that the Lord cares for us in a covenantal way. He cares for us because we're in an age where people say, well, who cares? What's the difference? It's the way our society sort of makes their, their laws. Well, what's the difference? As long as we're all happy, that's what's important. God is saying, no, that's not what is important. What is important is that you serve me. Who cares, people say. Even life itself is regarded by many people as insignificant. There are many, many ways <clears throat> in a sinful world uh, that people say, I don't really care about what happens, and I don't really care what I'm doing. Sometimes uh, we're brought to attention by tragedies. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had the tragedy, or a week ago, in Connecticut. And there were 20 people, <clears throat> young children, little children, who were gunned down, murdered. Six of the teachers were murdered as well. And the whole nation was grieving. <clears throat> and people were upset about this. 20 people, 26 people, actually, in one day gunned down, and they grieve about that. But they don't grieve about the fact that 3,200 children are aborted before they're ever born every day in our country. And so sometimes we say, well, we don't care about that. We just care about these tragedies that seem to strike from time to time. There are 39 murders committed every day in the United States. And we don't seem to care about those. We don't hear that mentioned very often. Our cares are sometimes exercised in how we feel, not how God feels. The care that many parents exercise over their children is likewise diminishing. People say they care about them. Well, they do in a sense. They buy them a lot of gifts. They buy them a lot of gadgets. And kids sit around playing games. But do they care for their souls? Is that kind of care? being exercised, the kind that God shows. So we live in a society, really, where people in the end have to say, well, we really don't care that much. We have certain concerns from time to time, but it's not the way God cares. When things don't go our way, it's very wrong to think that somehow God doesn't care. And when you hear all the discussions about tragedies, it's always that sort of, well, doesn't God care? Doesn't he care that this is happening? Of course he does. Of course God cares. He cares how we receive it and how, how we perceive it. He cares because he is watching over everyone, not just his people, but everyone, from the beginning to the end of the year. But his special love is on his people. And that's what he is exercising here as he says this. Once the disciples of Jesus were caught in a storm, you remember, on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was sleeping in the boat, and they were bouncing around in the boat, and they were frantic. And then they cry out to Jesus. They wake him up, and he says, Don't you care, Lord, that we're perishing? Don't you care? They were asking this of the very one who came to earth to lay his life down for them, and they're saying, don't you care? Of course he cares. And of course God cares for his people. He cares for his church. He cares for what goes on in the church. And he cares for every single member of that church, every member of the body. And he provides for them. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, we read, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he has already given us a savior, he's redeemed us like he did Israel. He set them free from Egypt, from that bondage for 400 years. 
Yes, God cares. And if he's given his own son, won't he give us everything? God had delivered Israel from that bondage in Egypt in order to give them a promised land. And he delivers us in the same way from the bondage of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ so that we might have freedom, freedom to serve our God. And he did that through the death of Christ and the miracle of the resurrection, setting us free. So don't ever ask that question, doesn't God care? Oh, yes, he cares. And as we look to the future, we are just like Israel. We have to look to the great things that God has done in the past. It's a good thing at the end of the year to sort of recap, to take your calendars down and to read. These are all the things I did. What a full year. And how God has carried us through the year. And then go back through your whole life and examine what God has done for you. God is doing that with Israel. He says, just turn back a while and look to see what the Lord has done. How he's brought you to this point in your life. What we sometimes fail to realize is that the Lord's care for us may involve the testing of our faith. Tragedy strike us. And you can look back at your own life and say, well, this happened to me and that happened to me. Those were terrible things and scary things. And the Lord brought me through those things also. The book of Hebrews tells us, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He corrects every son. And if you're not chastened by the Lord, then you're not one of his. The Lord chastens his people. He corrects us. The word chasten really has the idea of cleansing and a purging. And he does that. Not to destroy us, but to build us up. If you look at uh, the book of Deuteronomy again, if you go back to chapter 8 for a minute, if you have your Bibles open, go back to chapter 8. And we'll begin our reading at uh, verse 2. <clears throat> Just to read a few verses here. Of things we should remember... And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowing you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. When the Lord chastens us, it's because he cares. Not because he doesn't. It's because he cares. Whom he loves, he chastens. So remember, we read here, as God's warning to us, remember what I have done to you, how I humbled you in the wilderness, how there was no food so that I could give you the food and you would see it. How I tested you how I built you up. The whole idea of chastening is to build us up. Again, if you go back to uh, Hebrews where it speaks about that, it says that there might bring forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's the goal. Upright living before the Lord. Never may we say, nobody cares. God cares. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, repeats the covenant promise of God, and it says, I will never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. How many times in the scriptures are those words not written? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Why not? Because the Lord cares. He loves us, and he cares for us. The scriptures also tell us 
all, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. We're filled with cares, and our cares are completely different. They're worries. But the Lord's are, he doesn't worry about us. He provides for us. The Lord cares for your every need. He cares also for what you do and how you use your time. If you're going through life wasting your time, just sort of frittering it away, saying, well, I've got nothing to do, so I'll do nothing, or I'll play games, or I'll, I'll put myself uh, in, a, in a, a time warp where I'm not really producing anything in my life. He cares. It doesn't mean he worries, but he is concerned. And he mentions it often in the scripture. He demands, for example, that we be obedient to him and that we trust him and we look to his faithfulness. Here's the words from Deuteronomy 11, 7 and 8. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. Why is that? Go back. Your eyes have seen it. You've seen all the great acts of God. Therefore, for that reason, you should be obedient to God. You should do it out of thanksgiving. So God cares for us. He provides for us. Well, the next thing that we learn from this text is that the eyes of the Lord are always upon us, always upon us. There isn't one second in all of the time that God uh, spans out for us in which God says, I've taken my eyes off you for a while. His eyes are always upon us. Sometimes we complain. If you read the Psalms, you see uh, where the, Psalms, uh, the psalmist cries out, Lord, why are you so far from me? As though God's eyes were not looking at him, but his eyes are always upon us. Just as God provides for his people in the wilderness, and he provided them a land to dwell in, so he is going to watch for every provision we need in our lives. And as we read in our text, sometimes God withholds those things to test us. That's why in the wilderness there was no water. God could have had water every, every mile along the way had he wanted to do that, or he could have led them a different way. He led them into the desert to test them. And very often, he leads us into very dry areas of life to test us, to see whether we'll lift up our voice to him and seek his help or look to the idols of the world. How does the Lord do this? We call it providence, not chance. It isn't just a lucky thing that certain things happen in our lives. God provides those things. God's eyes don't just helplessly observe what is happening and then sort of step in now and then and correct those things. No, he ordains everything. He ordains the trials that are going to be upon you in this coming year. You can expect that. He will ordain that to test your faith and to make it stronger, to try it, as Peter says, like gold in the fire. He ordains it and he carries it out. But it is especially for his people he does this. His eyes are always upon us. In every circumstance and in every day of your life, the Lord is looking down on you. Sometimes we don't realize it because we're not looking at him. But God's eyes are always upon us. God's people have the assurance that he loves us. As he says in Deuteronomy 32, a little bit later, he says, Israel or the church, or today we would say the Christian, is the apple of God's eye. It's what delights him. Look at some of the scripture verses that speak about God's eyes, and, and these are only a sampling. And I was amazed at how often in the Bible it's mentioned that the eyes of the Lord are upon his people. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. 
It's as though the eyes uh, were like a radar. We're going back and forth through the whole earth, watching to show himself strong towards his people. Psalm 34, verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Psalm 139, verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and, your, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. There it's speaking about an unborn child, and God is already watching. His eye is upon that unborn child from the time of conception. That's a life, and God is watching over it. My substance being yet unformed. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21, we read, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The eyes of the Lord are upon man. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. He watches it all. He sees it all. And, it, and finally, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, we read, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You could go on and on. But what a beautiful thought that God is watching. And he isn't just watching the events of things. He's bringing them to pass. And he's not just seeing what we do, but he knows why we do it. The eyes of the Lord are a little deeper than just our eyes. He sees the heart. He sees the motive in your life. Why are you doing this? For what purpose are you doing this? He knows that because his eyes can pierce right to our soul. But you notice also that your eyes must also look at the, the great things that God has done. And if we fail to see uh, that God is the one who has brought us to where we are right now, this is sort of an Ebenezer moment as we sang in one of the hymns, now I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. Hitherto has the Lord brought us to this day. We didn't do it. God did. But our eyes need to be looking to him. In Psalm 123, verses 1 and 2, we read this. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he have mercy upon us. The question is, where are your eyes? And where are they looking? Are they looking to the Lord? Remember, the psalmist says in Psalm 141, verse 8, But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not, do not leave my soul destitute. When our eyes are upon the Lord, the one thing we're going to see is the wonderful and powerful acts of God. Our eyes are going to see our redemption through Christ his Son. Not just that he sent him to this earth, but he sent him to the cross. He sent him to the grave, and then he sent him to his right hand. Those are the things we should be seeing as well. Look at what God has done to release us from bondage through Christ. And look at the abundant supply that God has given us in our lives, the material things that we need. When we cry out to the Lord, he supplies those things. He's done it in his great providence. There's a question in a catechism that I'm familiar with, the Heidelberg Catechism question uh, asks, uh, what do you understand by the providence of God and how is that a blessing to you? What benefits do you get from the fact that God provides everything? by his fatherly hand. And the answer is threefold, that we be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and for what is future, for what is going to still take place, 
have confidence that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's our great hope for the new year. There's going to be a lot of things happening to us, adversity, prosperity. But the one thing we can put our confidence in is this. Nothing is going to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's what Romans chapter 8 tells us right at the end of that chapter. Nothing separates us from God's love. That means his eyes are lovingly upon us always. God's eyes are not only on our temporal, temporal lives and our outward circumstances, but he's looking at the heart and the motives of everything you do. Hebrews 4 verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So God's eyes truly are looking at us. And they're looking at us for good. To guide us and to lead us, maybe chasten us, maybe discipline us, testing us, but also to bless us. The last thing we want to look at in this thought is this. What would it be if God's eyes were not on us? And we dread to think, what the coming year would be like if God did not care for our souls. If he didn't care and he didn't provide for our souls, what would life be like? Now the heathens in this world, of course, go through life without that sort of care. But what if God's eyes were not upon us from the beginning of the year to the end of the year? What if we would live in darkness? What if? God says, I'm turning my head away from you. What would be our plight? How terrible would that be? That's why we need this comfort. Israel needed it, so do we. But let me ask you, if God's eyes are so important to us, then how important is it that we lift up our eyes to the Lord? It's not a one-way thing. You know, when you lift up your eyes to look to God in prayer, what do you see? You ought to be able to see God's eyes looking right back at you because he's watching you. His eyes are there from beginning of the year to the end of the year. The future of our unbelieving and sinful society sometimes looks pretty gloomy. And indeed, I think it is. You hear people meeting right now in the capital of, in Washington, D.C. because they're, they're afraid of going over the fiscal cliff that's their big concern. My concern is that we have already gone over the moral cliff. That's where our nation is. It's not finances. It's the morals. It's the obedience to the Lord. And look at your own life. Maybe you have a fiscal cliff too. And a lot of us are, are having problems financially. But that isn't our main problem. It's whether we're right with the Lord. That's our problem. Within a society that looks that gloomy, God is going to still care for his people. Look at Israel, where God cared for his people. There was a time when Elijah cried out. He says, Lord, I'm the only one left. Just take my life, get it over with, and I'm out of here. And God says, no. No, I'm still watching over my people. I've still got people up in a cave, and they're sheltered, and they're safe, and they're faithful to me. 7,000 haven't bowed their knees yet to an idol. But we're warned here. We're warned here in verse 16, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. If you do that, God says, I'll pour out my anger on you. Don't turn to the idols. Turn to God. So where are your eyes looking? Are they horizontal? Are they looking down? Or are they looking up? If God's eyes are upon us, our eyes should be on him who provides everything. We need daily to look to the Lord with a repentant heart and a heart that completely trusts in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our heart daily 
should be submitting to the Lordship of Christ. He's Lord of life. Every language, every name, every nation of the world, he is the Lord. It's not our leaders in different countries of the world. It's the Lord who is Lord of all. Our eyes should be upon him. We need daily to look to the tasks that our Lord has given us in our lives, all of which have but one purpose, to serve and to glorify our God. I have that one purpose. I don't have a lot of purposes, just one. And the Lord says, if you do that faithfully, I'll bless you. But we don't do it for the blessing. We do it for the glory of God. That's what it means to have our eyes upon the Lord. When you choose your vocation in life and you decide, what am I going to do in my life? Have your eyes on one thing, the glory of the Lord. Certainly, the Lord brings that out in all of these uh, verses that we have read. He mentions one thing over and over and over. He is Jehovah. He's the great I am. He's the eternal God. The Lord, your God, is where you should have your eyes. And you can look to the heavens and expect something else. If you read the book of Revelation, of course, you see the, the coming of Christ is emphasized. The glory of the Lord appearing. The great warrior. The great victor. Our eyes should be looking expectantly to heaven for the coming of Christ as well. But until that day, we need still to look to the Lord in our lives. And God lays out for us the blessings. And he says, if you just look to me and serve me, I will bless your lives. If you look to the idols, I'll withhold my blessings. So what does he require us to do? Verse 18, he begins to say, lay these words up. Where? Not in your mind. Don't write them in your notebooks in your heart. Whatever drives you in life, that's the words I want you to have. I'm watching over you. I'm caring for you. Beginning to end. And then he says in verse 19, teach these things to your children. These are not just words for you. These are words for you and for the next generation and the next generation until the Lord comes. Teach them to your children. Every opportunity you have, when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, put them on the doorposts of your house. Put them everywhere before your children that they too may know the great God of salvation, that they may know Jesus Christ, the provision that God has made for our souls, for our eternity. He requires us to have God's commands all around us from morning till night because the Lord is watching over us from beginning to end of each year. If we can find comfort in the fact that the Lord's eyes are upon us, then let's resolve something in this year that our eyes will be upon the Lord, that we'll look to him in worship, in prayer, in song, in joy or in sorrow, that we'll look to him. And when we do, our eyes will meet with the eyes of our God, who is always looking upon us, always looking at you. How beautifully the psalmist puts this in Psalm 145 when he says, the eyes of all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. What a wonderful thing to be able to look to the Lord. That's by grace. It doesn't come naturally. Naturally, man looks everywhere but to the Lord. By the grace of God, by his redeeming love, by his Holy Spirit who dwells within us, we can look to the Lord. And we must, for if there is no other God. Remember what Isaiah said? There is no other God. I am the Lord. I'm it. 
So you don't have to look around for God. There's only one. And if you look up in prayer, you'll find him. We tend to worry a lot about, spiritual, about material things, but God supplies all of those things. And that's what Jesus reminds us of in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, don't worry about what you'll wear and where you'll get your food. What should we be concerned about? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. Just look to the Lord. Seek that kingdom. There's only one way that you'll have a blessed new year. And that is if God is looking upon you and caring for you. And then in that joy, you will also look to him. If these words of promise weren't here in our text, we would have a miserable new year and we would perish. It would be unimaginable to face even a day outside of God's love and care and his watchfulness over us. The unbeliever does that. That's how he lives his life. Never looks to God. Never cares if God is looking at him. But by the grace of God, as Christians, it should be our resolve to look to him. To look to him for salvation. To look to him to preserve us in that faith that he has created in us. To look to him so that when Christ appears, we'll receive him with great joy, with acclamation, because that will be for us the end of this life, but the beginning of everlasting life. God is faithful to keep that promise that he's given here. The question is, will we? Will we be faithful to look to him? God is faithful. He won't break his word but will we in this coming year? This year, again, humbly ask God for his grace and for his Holy Spirit to completely and to daily trust him and love him and serve him, to do it all year long, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That should be our resolve because of what God has promised he is doing for us. And with that, we can say we will have a blessed new year and many more after that. Amen. Let's bow our heads and come to the Lord in prayer.